This is Allegra Smith, English 421 online instructor, and today I'm going to talk to you about the content and structure of resume writing. There's a separate lecture that'll come later about the design of resumes. Both of these are really important, but there's so much information to cover that I thought I'd separate them into two videos. So first, I wanted to address that you might have heard different information about what to include on your resume or how to write a resume. There's lots of different people who like to tell college students what they should include on their job documents. Um, so who do you take advice from when you're trying to put together your resume? Um, for English 421 alone, there are textbook, there's a textbook for the class, um, there's me, a writing instructor, there are also people who work at career services here at Purdue and at other institutions uh, who are going to give you advice on what to include on your resume. And then outside of that, you might talk with hiring managers or working professionals in your field of study. And in technical writing, we have lots of different majors and programs represented from Purdue, everywhere from biochemistry to engineering, to clinical psychology, to public health, even to the humanities. Um, you might have different advice that you hear from your friends or from your parents. I know that uh, I'm working on a job document. I often send it to my dad to take a look at. People at the writing lab might give you different information as well as writers for publications online. I know that if I'm faced with a new document to write and I don't know what to do, I often Google how to write X or Y document. Um, so who are we gonna listen to when we're trying to construct a resume that will be effective and that will reflect our own unique professional identity? Uh, the answer to this question is the ultimate rhetorical answer, which is, it depends. Um, I love to tell you to listen to what I have to say all the time and that I'm always right, but the truth is that you're going to be applying to your own field that I might not understand the conventions of. So when in doubt, it's best to defer to the knowledge of the people who are going to be reading your applications. Um, because they're the ones who are ultimately going to decide whether you get that first interview or not. A great example of this is a couple of years ago, I was teaching business writing and I had a marketing student come in and tell me that she met with a hiring manager who told her that her cover letter was too long and that instead of writing three or four paragraphs about her job experiences, she should present them in bullet points. Now initially, I balked at this because a cover letter is different from a resume. A resume typically has brief uh, sentences that start with active verbs that give a broad overview of your skills and your experiences. And the cover letter is where you go more in depth into a couple of stories or projects or positions. Um, so to be using bullet points in your cover letter seemed kind of redundant when your resume is already doing that. Um, but she assured me that the hiring manager told her to do this, and if she wanted a position at that company, she should probably pay attention to what he had to say. So even though it goes against my training and her training, she ultimately wrote a separate cover letter for this position that included bullet points instead of paragraphs, and she got the position. So, of course, take what I have to say seriously. I've trained a lot of students to apply for a lot of different jobs, um, but consider who the source of your information is and maybe adjust your documents accordingly. So that's my uh, big disclaimer at the beginning of this lesson. So first up, we're gonna talk about resume writing, um, content and structure specifically. So what sections we have in our resume and what the text should say. Um, design will come later, but it's no less important. So first off, consider your resume format. Um, the average time that a hiring manager or HR professional spends looking at a resume is about five to seven seconds. So you need to write it and format it in a way that it's easily scannable so that folks can get the information that they need quickly and so that it's a very um, brief representation of your identity and ethos as a professional. For the purposes of this class, you're gonna wanna produce a one-page single-sided resume. And generally, this is what hiring managers expect from folks applying for entry-level positions or first internships, like most of you will be doing for English 421. Um, 
If you're later on in your career, you might have a multi-page resume. I have a multi-page resume because I'm applying to professor jobs, but you should keep your work to one page for this class. Now, if you're struggling to fit stuff on one page, we can talk about how to condense, um, and you can also break out the margins a little bit to give yourself some more space. Your resume should be reflective of your personal brand. So you need to think about what type of characteristics or qualities you want to reflect as a professional and make sure that the wording that you use in your resume does that. Um, one thing that's really helpful to figure out how to do this is to think about the qualities that the organization or company is looking for. So going through job ads and seeing what they value and making sure that the language you use in your job documents emphasizes that. And perhaps the most critical thing you'll learn in this lesson is to think about action verbs. Um, so the real meat and work of your resume is in the action words that you use to describe your experiences and your skills as a professional. Words like managed, supervised, observed, oversaw, um, calculated, facilitated. Um, you can see in the list that I just gave, all of those verbs were specific and targeted. They linked with particular skills, um, quantitative skills, management skills, investigative skills, and they were all in the same tense. They were all past tense verbs. So you need to be consistent with the tense of your action verbs in your resume and make sure that they are specific and targeted. So not vague words like worked or um, uh, contributed, but instead specific and targeted ones. In your resume, you need to have section headings to make it easily scannable. Um, usually the headings that um, are used are educational experience, professional experience, and then something like community engagement or awards. We'll go over that again in a moment. Um, you need to make sure that the terminology that you use is specific and targeted, but not so technical that a hiring manager who's unfamiliar with your line of work can't understand it. So an example, if you were working at Jurassic Park and you cleaned dino teeth as part of your position, that should go under the experience heading. But cleaned dino teeth, one, is a little bit informal because you're using dino as an abridged version of dinosaur. Um, and it doesn't quite fit with the terminology of the field. Um, so a more specific way to do this would be to say, administer dental hygiene for multiple species, including Velociraptor and Tyrannosaurus rex. So an average layperson will still understand what administered dental hygiene means, but you're specifying here that you have work uh, experience with particularly dangerous species, which makes it more impressive than just cleaned dino teeth alone. So what are you gonna include on your resume? Here are the sections of a typical resume. Um, first, you've got your contact information at the top. You provide information or education. And since you are all still in school, education should come up first before work experience. Some folks include a skills section that talks about technical or other proficiencies they might have. Um, certifications. So if you have certifications in particular programming languages or a project management certificate or something similar, um, and then honors and awards. So first, your contact information. At the top of your resume, you're gonna need to give basic information on yourself so that the hiring manager knows who you are and where to find you. Give your full name, the name that's going to be on your application, your address, your email address, your phone number, and if you have a professional portfolio website, you can link to that. Your education information should include all colleges you have attended. If you are more than one semester out of high school at this point in your college career, you'll want to omit high school information from your resume. For your college education, you want to provide the full name of the institution you're attending, as well as the city and the state. Um, I know it's going to surprise you, but a lot of people outside of Indiana don't know where Purdue is located. Uh, so you'll want to say Purdue University, West Lafayette, Indiana. Provide your expected graduation date, your degree or degrees, majors, minors, and concentrations if relevant, and then sometimes your GPA or relevant coursework. 
I know that a lot of the recruiters here at Purdue who go to career fairs like Industrial Roundtable or the Cranert Career Fair specifically request that applicants for internships have a particular GPA or higher because their positions are very competitive. So include your GPA only if it's needed for an internship. For relevant coursework, Include your coursework only if it's pertinent to the positions you're applying for and will help you land the position. Don't just use coursework to pad your resume. For the work experience section, you're going to mirror the conventions of your education section. Give the name of the company that you uh, worked at, the location, the duration of employment. So I worked at the uh, Journal and Tribune from 2016 to 2018. Give your job title or titles if you had multiple titles throughout your time at the company or organization. And then give three to five bullet points that give short declarative statements using a strong action verb up front to talk about the work that you did at this place. Um, ways to craft good statements in your bullet points. First consider what your responsibilities were. So for example, my first job was not a professor or a teaching position. I worked at a pizza place and I cut toppings, answered phones, and worked the cash register. Um, now this doesn't seem very impressive, but when you consider what my position did for the larger organization, uh, I helped keep things running, right? I was the face of the business because I was the one working with customers up front. So it showed off data skills because I was working with money. It showed off communication skills because I was working with customers and leadership skills. Um, so I would use words like facilitated or calculated or communicated or resolved when describing my tasks. If you can quantify your work at all, so if you can use numbers to show off the scope or scale of what you did, that's even better. Um, so for example, if you worked for a student organization and you oversaw a fundraiser that raised a certain amount of money, put that amount of money down. If you were a supervisor who managed shifts and schedules for 30 employees, put that number down because it shows the hiring manager and other people on the hiring committee the scope of the work that you've done. So here's an example of making descriptions that are more powerful. Um, Try not to make your bullet points extend over two lines on a page. These are only extending that long because the text is big. Um, so if I worked at a writing center, I might say that I tutored undergraduate students in writing. And that's somewhat impressive. But this second phrase demonstrates the scale and the scope of what I've done. Consulted not only undergraduate students, but faculty, visiting scholars, and graduate students in one-on-one -on -one conferences to enhance literacy practices and foster proofreading skills. So you get a sense of what we're specifically talking about in these consultations, and then I'm working one-on-one -on -one with people. So it's targeted, it's specific. Here's another one. I can say that I gave presentations for the writing lab, which hints at some leadership and presentation and oral communication skills, but again, isn't very specific about what these presentations look like. If I say I designed and facilitated workshops, you get a sense that not only did I give these presentations, but I also created them, and that they're workshops, so they're interactive, it's not just me talking. And then I say that those workshops were on document design, grammar and style, citation and sentence style for both graduate and undergraduate students. So you understand now the expertise that I'm bringing to this position, not just that I gave presentations. I mentioned earlier that you want to use consistent verb tense for your resume bullet points. So you'll see on the left that there are a few different verbs and if I scan down the side of the column, I see analyzed, which is a past tense verb, management, which is a verb meaning to a noun, surveying, which is a gerund, and then led, which is another past tense verb. You're gonna want all your verbs to be in past tense, even for positions that you currently hold just because it's more consistent and it's easier to scan on the side of the page. You'll see in option B, I just look down the bullet point, see analyzed, managed, surveyed, and led. So I get a sense quickly at a glance in five to seven seconds what this person's skills are. Speaking of skills, 
If you have a skills section, you're going to want to use it to talk about technical specific skills. What we call soft skills like interpersonal communication or even something that's obviously expected of all employees now like skills with Microsoft Office should not go here because one, these are skills you should already have and two, they're going to be illustrated already through your bullet points in your cover letter. The skills section here is for things like technical proficiencies. So if you're a computer engineer who has skills in specific programming languages, or if you're a videographer who knows how to use specific classes and categories of equipment, a skills section might be for you. But if you are, for example, a nurse and you're applying to entry-level nursing positions, you likely won't have a skills section because any sort of targeted expertise, for example, with a specific area of patient care, let's say you're a geriatric nurse or you're an OBGYN nurse, will be evidence through your bullet points. So this is all to say, if you have a skills section, it should be technical and targeted. You can separate your skills into categories. So for example, programming language experience, and then experience with particular software, and then experience in particular natural languages. You're gonna want the list to be organized in order of relevance to the position you're applying for, and then you might wanna distinguish levels of expertise. This is really common when talking about natural languages. So if you're bilingual or multilingual, you might be fluent in English, you might have intermediate proficiency in French, and you might have basic understanding of Mandarin Chinese. So distinguishing these will give your reader a sense of what your expertise is. For honors and awards, if you have been on the Dean's List or you've won an award in your community, you've gotten a distinguished scholarship, you might want to include a section on this. For the awards, give the title of the award and the year awarded. I hope this has helped you out with thinking about resume writing and structure. Um, please move on to the next video, which talks about the same principles, but for writing cover letters. And like I said, we'll talk about design later on in the course. Feel free to ask me if you have any questions. See you later.